So welcome to International Museum Day and to Museums Unite, the fastest cross-country trip you will ever take. Um, my name is Chris O'Connor and I'm a learning program developer here at the Royal BC Museum. I'm grateful to live, work, and raise a family on the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people known today as the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. So now I know when I go traveling, back when that was a thing, I would always search out the museums and cultural centers in every town and city I went to. Museums are awesome, or rather museums are mostly awesome. Um, and they also can be really complicated. And addressing and unpacking those complications are vital to the work of museums. Today, we unite around what museums can be. We unite around museums as spaces created by and for community, spaces that are safe and inclusive, spaces that strive for equality and justice and spaces that embrace critical thinking and joy. And being a museum educator myself, I know that critical thinking and joy are central to my work and the work of my colleagues. Um, sorry, I just need to, whoop. <laughs> sorry about this. Uh, so these are my, these are the colleagues here. Um, and I want to thank, thank them so much for agreeing to, to say yes to this, um, this exercise today to celebrate museums and celebrate their museums. So I've asked fellow museum, museum educators from across Canada to show, give us a little peek at the one part of the museum that they would show a vis visitor if time was ticking. Um, the museum is closing at 5 p.m. and you only have five minutes. So where would you take them and why? After we visit with these five museums, we'll have a chance to make connections, ask questions, learn more. The second half of the event is like hanging out on the museum steps uh, after the doors are closed for the evening. So I'm currently in Victoria, which is the dot to the far left. The next dot, dot along is Edmonton, our friends in Edmonton. The next dot is our friend in Regina. The next dot is our friend in Toronto. And our, the last dot, the furthest away, is our friend in Halifax. Um, and we start our journey there today. Um, we start our journey at the Canadian Museum of Immigration at Pier 21 with Stephanie Webb. Stephanie, for over a decade, Stephanie has been connecting people's minds and hearts to the stories that surround us. When she's not being an enthusiastic museum nerd, Stephanie dreams of Chinese soup dumplings croissants and sneaking out for an early morning surf before her toddler, toddler wakes up. So Stephanie, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Thank you. Oh, okay. So let me just launch straight in. There we are. To what I would do. Hmm. Let's just make sure this is the right button to press on my computer. All right. So <laughs> here I, so can you see, can you see my yep, screen? All's good. Awesome. And let's just see how we go through. <laughs> I just want to check in. Hold on. I'm sorry, guys. I think I clicked the wrong thing. I'm just going to go over to the other one. Arg. Nope. Still doing the wrong one. All right, we are just gonna, we're just gonna go for it, guys. So here I am um, on the left, obviously at work as a heritage interpreter at the Canadian Museum of Immigration up here 21. And on the left, uh, that's me doing what I think is fun things. Um, and in this case, it's moving a tent um, to a new campsite. And where I work is here. Uh, let's see, why am I having this screen? Oh no. Guys, there we go. So this is the Canadian Museum um, of Immigration at Pier 21. And so today this building is the museum that I work at, but between the years of 1928 until 1971, this was an immigration facility. And hundreds of thousands of people moved through this space as they immigrated to Canada. And most people were coming on ships 
And so a lot of folks would have seen this sign on the outside of the building as they arrived. And how you got from the ship into this building was on a gangway like this. These were lightweight, they were movable, they were kind of like an invention that happened for Pier 21, which is pretty cool. And where you go from this gangway, well, into this space over here. So today, this is part of our Pure 21 exhibition, and I would always bring someone here because this is where a lot of people took their first steps into Canada. And for a lot of Canadians, this is where their family's history of being in Canada started. And if you look at the very far end, those tags hanging on the walls, always, like, always go over and have a little read because this is where visitors have shared their family stories. We can see my father arrived here in 1952 from Germany. Uh, in the middle, mes grands-parents sont arrivés ici d'Italie. And on the far right, we see how a man came as a boy with his mom from England. Now, the other part of our museum, I would definitely have to bring you here to the beginning where we have this projection up on the wall that's uh, on the right-hand side. And this exhibition, this is our Canadian Immigration Hall. It's an overview of over 400 years of immigration history. And so this projection, it shows the major movements of people coming to this country. And with visitors, you know, they always move the timeline because it's a timeline. And they move it around to see, you know, oh, this is when my family arrived. And oh, okay, I can see it's part of this group of people coming to this country. And then I'll go up to them and I go, all right, so I have a question for you. What parts of the world do you see represented? And then what parts aren't being represented? And, and does that change? And why do you think that is? Now, as you, oh, and I do want to point out, um, it's a small detail, but it's one that matters to me. Um, the area of land that's in green, not what we call Canada today, it's green for the entire duration of the projection. And the reason for that, it's to indicate uh, the continuous and continued presence of Indigenous peoples here in Canada. Now, as you move through the exhibition, you come into this space. And I want to draw your attention to these two huge photographs that are juxtaposed, both in position, but also in context. The photograph on the left, we see a family that has arrived. They have in their passport landed immigrant. They are welcomed. They are on their way to becoming Canadian. And on the right hand side, we see people that were not given that chance. These are passengers of the ship called the Komagata Maru that arrived off the west coast of Canada in 1914. They're British subjects trying to immigrate from, uh, to Canada from India. They were refused entry. They were told no, they were not welcomed. And so the challenge here that I always pose visitors now is go through this space with a critical eye. Ask yourself who has been welcomed, who has not been welcomed, why? Ask yourself what are the mechanisms in place that dictate who can come in and who can't and who makes those decisions? And how has this changed? Has it changed? And also, these decisions of who's in, who's out, how has that impacted the kind of country we have today and who we think of as Canadian? Now, at the end of this exhibition, we have this map and we've just redone the very end of our Canadian immigration hall. So this is brand new for us. And this map is where visitors have left their own immigration histories. And I wanna show you a few of them. So you can see it's a selection my mother fled a civil war, walked from Eritrea to Sudan. My mom came from China to Canada with me in her tummy. I escaped for life because I'm gay. And this one's from Sri Lanka. Uh, J'ai quitté le Burundi en 2007 pour rejoindre mon mari. Uh, my ancestors came from Bretagne in the 1700s and his great grandmothers were indigenous women. My great grandfather Lear came to British Columbia from the UK and my grandfather, this man's grandfather came over hundred years ago from Japan. So I want to point out, immigration, it's not a thing that you can hang up on a wall or have in a display case. It's an intangible experience. And the best way to really 
get into this is through stories, which is why I'm really grateful for every story that is shared with us. And so the little challenge I have for you moving forward is what's your story? So thank you for being awesome and coming on my highlights tour. And if you ever have any questions about the museum, we are definitely here for you. Hey, thank you so much, Stephanie. And Halifax has been beautiful and we've loved being there, but we have a plane to catch uh, to Toronto. So we're gonna go from, but, and I saw there's a question. So we'll, we're get, during our discussion period. So hold those questions about um, all those amazing uh, points of entry that Stephanie just offered up, generously offered up. Um, and we'll come back to that during the, the, um, the discussion period. Um, but our plane to Toronto is leaving right now. So we are getting on the plane from Halifax and going to Toronto. And we arrive to meet Kieran Mukherjee um, at the Royal Ontario Museum. So Kieran is a, um, Kieran is a educator who works with students of all ages to help creatively, creatively express their scientific curiosity and wonder. After 18 years at the Royal Ontario Museum, primarily as the ROM Kids Camp Director, Kieran believes in the profo profound power that science, art, and story have on children's learning and development. Um, and Jenny, I think that you're still, uh, oh, there you go. Great. There is Kieran. Hello, Kieran. We've made it to Toronto. We're so glad to see you. It's, it's a, beautiful city. It's to a beautiful city you have. Thank you. We're all right. Uh, all the cities uh, on this uh, on this call tonight are all wonderful, and I'm so excited to be with you. Can I go? Can I start? You are up. You're five minutes. It's it's four fifty five, and the museum closes at five. So you are up. All right, friends. Uh, hi, my name is Kieran. I love dinosaurs and stories. I'm a big Taylor Swift fan. I'm the cam director at the ROM. This is my institution. It's a crystal. Some people love it. Some people don't. I think it's all right. Um, where I've worked for almost two decades, I also teach science communication with the ROM and Fleming College program, environmental visual communication. Being in Toronto with the ROM, we recognize this is the traditional territory for many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and that, that this continues to be the home for many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people today. When I think about homes, I think about Toronto where I've grown, and more specifically the ROM, where I've spent my entire life. Um, I came to camp here as a kid. You can see some of our, our camp action right there. Look at those cute little guys wearing those dinosaur tails. Um, this is our camp enjoying our rotunda. This is me wearing butterfly wings at a science fair that we did right there. It was a lot of fun. Um, so when I think about the ROM and I think about homes, I think about the ROM and I think about this camp that I came to as a kid where I, then I started working here when I was 14 and 19 years later, I volunteered, instructed, played a lot of dodgeball and talked a lot about dinosaurs. And now I run the camp that I love so much. The ROM has been the most consistent thing in my life and often it has felt like my real home, uh, that my real homes have felt like my home away from homes, if you can, can sort of catch that. The ROM is as familiar to me as a bee to a flower or a fish to the ocean or a pigeon to my balcony. So thinking of one thing I would highlight is hard. Do I wanna showcase the museum or an object within it? Do I highlight an issue like mummies and consent? Do I tell a story, a memory? But three minutes, one visitor, one story, let's not waste time walking anywhere. Let's go straight from the entrance to the largest dinosaur on display in Canada and one of the largest in the world. This is Futalonchosaurus right there. Um, Futalonchosaurus lived around 87 million years ago in what is now Argentina, is a member of the herbivorous titanosaur group, the largest dinosaurs, in fact, animals to walk the earth ever. Often when we find dinosaurs, we find only a part of it, uh, a vertebrae, a toe, a tooth. Here we got ribs. They might have been delicious, but Fuda was found remarkably well preserved. So we were able to scan the fossils, spin them into a computer, and come with an 
incredibly accurate 3D model. So when we show Futalocosaurus was this big, we know it for sure. About eight or so years ago, we put Futalocosaurus on display for an amazing exhibit called Ultimate Dinosaurs. How long did it take to put up? Not weeks or days, but one single night. And I got to say to see it. It was brought in on the backs of 18 wheeler trucks. Fudo was so big, we needed to take off the doors to the main entrance. Over the course of the night, section by section was put into place. You can see how you can sort of stand right underneath Fudalonchosaurus right there. It's a very immersive experience. Um, over the night, it was put into place and in the, in the light of day, the paleontologists and workers uh, looked at it and they pondered and they said, you know what? It's the wrong color, it's too red. So the next night they came back in to make it more brown, to make, uh, to make it match the color of the rocks that it was found in. You can walk under Futalonchosaurus, you can sit with her, you can think with her, you can be with her, you can be immersed with this exceptional dinosaur. My favorite museum objects and displays are the ones that come with a story. And Fuda fits that bill and the amount of time we have. Thank you from Toronto. Oh, and then I need to take a pic. Sorry, sorry, I need to do this. I need to do this, Chris, so I can remember that this happened. Please, this. please, <laughs> we support that. That this happened, nice. Okay, this was fun, everyone. Can't wait to hear your questions. <laughs> And Toronto was very fun. It was like a whirlwind and- um, It's like you just zoom in and the, zoom the, out, am I right? The, the food was great. <laughs> um, and and now, but but our, now we have a plane to catch to go to Regina. And uh, we're gonna go to the Royal Saskatchewan Museum. So we're moving west. We went as far east as we could go um, while still be, with still not being wet. Um, and then uh, now we're going west and we're going to the Royal Saskatchewan Museum and meeting Rebecca Hay. So Rebecca is the Earth Science Program Specialist at the Royal Saskatchewan Museum. She is a passionate ed museum educator who loves to share and engage people with Saskatchewan's natural history stories. In her spare time, you can find her spending time outdoors with her family and super fluffy dog, uh, Balto. But Balto is not with you today, Rebecca, right? No, unfortunately, I'm sure oh. he would love to be here, yeah. though. <laughs> <laughs> we'll imagine Balto with you. Sounds so, good. Regina is lovely. We're glad to be here. And, uh, and we're, <laughs> we look forward to hearing what you want to show, show us. Fantastic. Yes. Welcome. Welcome to Regina. Welcome to the Royal Saskatchewan Museum. Uh, like you just found out, my name is Rebecca and I'm just so honored to be able to present to you. Uh, before I begin, I do want to acknowledge that I am grateful to be able to work and live and present to you on Treaty 4 territory, the original lands of the Cree, the Soto, the Nakoda, the Lakota, and the Dakota, as well as the homeland of the Métis Nation. Uh, there are so many things at the Royal Saskatchewan Museum that I would love to show you, but as you know, we are closing in five minutes. So I'm going to have to choose one of our specimens and artifacts. They all have wonderful stories. How about we go and look for a fossil bone story? It's, it's a huge one, follow me. Welcome to the CN T-Rex gallery. This amazing creature behind me is Scotty the T-Rex. Now this is a replica and we have a replica here at the Royal Saskatchewan Museum, as well as our, at our sister uh, museum, the T-Rex Discovery Center in Southwest Saskatchewan. Now these fossil bones have an amazing story. And the first story is from the 21st tail vertebra of Scotty, because that is the first a uh, bone that was found in Southwest Saskatchewan and that, that was 30 years ago this August. So it's been a while. And that story is the story of an amazing T-Rex because what they didn't know at that time was it wasn't just one vertebra, but rather about 65% of this creature was found, which is great. And so it took a long, long time to get this huge, magnificent dinosaur out of the hill 
Um, when they did, though, they were able to study these bones and find out more about Scotty's amazing life. Now, it would be it would be scary to be in Saskatchewan a long time ago. Um, you would try to hide in the big redwood trees of that time. Right now, you would be going through rolling prairie. It would be scary, but you know what? It seems like it might have been scary for Scotty as well. Scotty has lots of evidence of dangerous things happening. For example, on Scotty's upper jaw, uh, they're missing a tooth and it's actually grown in with bone. So it's evidence that there was some sort of wound and damage also behind there. You can see a little uh, spot on the skull that's pitted and there's evidence of a, a place where the bone was diseased and infected, also probably from a wound. So I can imagine this T-Rex fighting with another T-Rex or maybe just fighting with its prey. Pretty dangerous life. If we move further down, there are some ribs that are really thickened. And so there's evidence that, that this animal had broken bones at, some, at one point. And also if we move down back into the tail, there are three uh, vertebra that are a bit deformed. They're kind of squished. They don't articulate very well. And if you've ever had a back problem, you know that you'd like to see your uh, chiropractor about that. I don't think that Scotty had that available to them. So I don't know how this dinosaur dealt with the pain. Now, these fossil bones have even more to tell us, um, but sometimes the story is a mystery. And for Scotty, the mystery is whether Scotty was male or female. The bones are holding that mystery tight. We don't know. There was no medullary bone. That's bone that's, um, created when an animal is about to lay an egg. There's no evidence of that in Scotty, so we don't know. Could be a boy, could be a girl, we don't know. But what we do know, if we look up at this great big femur, uh, researchers looked at the circumference of Scotty's femur and used that to try to figure out just how big this animal was. And it turns out, huge. Scotty weighed about 8,600 kilograms, uh, really, really huge. In fact, the largest T-Rex that has ever been found came from here in Saskatchewan, which I think is really cool. So that is a really big T-Rex bone story from Saskatchewan, but we also have a really tiny T-Rex bone story. So not only is Saskatchewan home to the largest T-Rex that's ever been found, but also to the smallest T-Rex that's ever been found. So what you're looking at here is a little uh, metatarsal, so a uh, foot bone from a nestling, a very small baby T-Rex. And that is only about 10 centimeters long. If we look at the adult version of the same bone, it's about 70 centimeters. So there is a lot of growth. So if you visited Saskatchewan 66 million years ago, you might see a nestling, so like a scary chicken all the way up to a massive, amazing creature like Scotty. And so I know we're closing, but I hope that you can come visit us again sometime here in Regina so that you can visit Scotty face-to-face uh, -face or at the T-Rex Discovery Center in East End, Saskatchewan. Thanks for letting me visit with you all. Thanks for giving us that tour before before you closed, and um, that was that was amazing and a nice You're sort of connections right. with um, with Toronto as well. So um, also Regina was very lovely, uh, and we're now going west. And rather than taking an airplane, we're gonna because we want to see the wide open um, land. So we're gonna drive uh, to Edmonton. So the next place we're gonna go to is Edmonton. Uh, Alberta, and uh, we have both Eleonora uh, Sermonetta and Lisa Kaiser uh, from the Royal Alberta Museum. So Eleonora um, works with the Royal Alberta Museum as adult learning uh, programmer, as a heritage professional and a new Canadian. She's passionate about connecting with and actively participating in the cultural and social life of her community. And Lisa is a school programmer with the Royal Alberta Museum. She's worked in education for the last 11 years as a classroom teacher, program coordinator, and alongside her role 
uh, at the RAM is a casual access assistant at McEwen University. So we are so glad to have arrived in Edmonton. You have a new museum, relatively new museum. Um, so we're uh, excited to, to see it in the, in the five minutes before the museum closes. So um, hi, you two. We're so glad that, to, to be here with you and take it away. Thank you so much, Chris. We're so excited to be here, everyone. Thank you for having us and welcome to the Royal Alberta Museum. Like Chris said, my name is Lisa. Oh my goodness, I love long walks through the Human History Hall. I love my cat, Alice, and I love working with students. It brings me so much joy, but I love working with the public here at the RAM. So again, I'm the school programmer, and I'm so excited to join you today. Hi everyone, I'm Eleonora, and today we're going to see our wow factor together. So what's the wow factor here at the Royal Alberta Museum? Uh, oh, by the way, we're based in Edmonton, Amiskwachi, Waskahigan. We are from Treaty 6 territory. Uh, so, as I was saying, uh, we are going to uh, take a look at our wow factor. And for us, the wow factor uh, lies in our dioramas. Well, to begin with, what is a diorama? A diorama, in a nutshell, can be defined as a, a scene that recreates and captures a specific moment in time. In the context of our museum, Dioramas uh, focuses on uh, natural history and in particular with the flora and the fauna of Alberta. So dioramas uh, are is a painstakingly recreated lifelike habitat as the one you can see here uh, in the background. And uh, uh, they are basically windows of nature. They have a very important role, which is the one of educating our public about natural history and also uh, engendering feelings of wonder in and stewardship of the natural world. Here at the Royal Alberta Museum, we have several types of dioramas. So for example, we have this one that looks uh, sort of classics, but it has a twist that I'm going to uh, share with you uh, later on. We also have uh, uh, the 360 ones, like for example here, you can see this is a circular one. So this is a model, of course, we have a, a life-size one, which is way bigger. And uh, uh, we call them 360s because uh, you can literally go around and appreciate the scene from multiple angles, from multiple perspectives. In uh, uh, museums, usually dioramas uh, uh, utilize uh, taxidermy animals. But here at the Royal Alberta Museum, we have some special dioramas. For example, we can uh, start to get closer to this one. You can see that we have some uh, taxidermy animals, just like any other museums. In this case, we have a community of different animals. We have this uh, American badger over here. We have the Richardson ground uh, squirrel, some uh, burrowing owls over there. And please take a closer look over here because uh, we have a live animal that is living right in this diorama. So in this specific case, uh, our uh, guest resident over here is a, a bull snake, which is one of the largest snakes here in Alberta, sometimes reaching more than two meters in length. They are non-venomous and subdue their prey by striking with enough force to stun the small animal. Sometimes they coil around their prey, you know, to constrict it if it's needed. Bull snakes have similar patterns as the prairie rattlesnakes and even mimic rattlesnakes behavior by hissing, rattling their tail and striking. So looking and acting like a rattlesnake while not being legitimately venomous and dangerous is an example of Batesian mimicry. And obviously this is a defensive mechanism. So this provides uh, you know, uh, some protection to uh, our guests. In this case, our snake is called Ferdinand, by the way. <laughs> and uh, over there, you can see one of our uh, live animals. Uh, uh, exactly, hi Pete, <laughs> hello. <laughs> so he's the supervisor of the live animal team. So they take good care of our uh, live animals because you know, this is not the only diorama that has uh, uh, live animals. Sometimes we have a combination of, uh, uh, you know, taxidermy animals and live one, and sometimes we have just live animals, just like the, the next diorama that I'm going to show you. And Lisa is going to be there. You can follow us. There we go. 
Come on over, everybody. Come take a close look at one of my favorite live animals here at the rim, our Western painted turtles. So get a close look at their beautiful colored bellies and their striped heads and, and feet. Now they're called painted turtles because of their amazing coloring. Now here we see two males and two female turtles. We have, of course, artist names for them. We have Rembrandt, Banksy, Frida Kahlo, and Emily Carr. These are the only turtle species native to Alberta. However, many are already extirpated or locally extinct, unfortunately. Only found on the Milk River in southern Alberta, they are at the extreme north end of their range in North America and are likely to shrink back south into Montana as the Milk River dries up more frequently. Thankfully, there are populations also in BC. Now, we are very fortunate to have these four in a rescue situation. They had been living in captivity before they came to the ram and unfortunately could not be released back into the wild. Now they are under the amazing care of our live animal team, as you saw with Pete taking care of the other diorama. Here, these guys can make sure they have the proper water temperatures, the food that they need to stay healthy, and also, again, the exercise that they need for these guys with, a, with enough space to roam around together. Now, a couple of interesting facts about these turtles. They can live underwater for around 100 days, and they can absorb oxygen through their skin. Also, temperature can determine the sex of the turtles. So, for example, if the temperature of the eggs in a nest is above 30 degrees Celsius, all of those eggs will hatch as females. If it's below 24 degrees Celsius, they will all be males. And if the range is somewhere in between, they will hatch as both females and males. And again, these guys are happily swimming. They were fed just yesterday, a mixture of vegetables and shrimp, as well as some specialized turtle food. In the wild, these animals would be eating aquatic plants, snails, insects, and even amphibians or fish, both alive or dead. They are a wonderful addition to the ram, and we are so fortunate to have them to share with our visitors and to learn and, and just, again, experience what a wonder that they are. Thank you so much, everybody. We hope you enjoyed our segment of the tour. We look forward to your questions. Great, right, thank you so much. I wanna, I wanna jump in there and swim with the turtles. Um, but we are, um, we are on a schedule and we have to get to Victoria. Um, I have to get back home. Um, and instead of taking a plane or a car, I think maybe let's just all get on bikes and bike over the mountains. It's gonna be hard, but we can do it. I know we can do it. Bike over the mountains and into BC from Alberta and then across BC and take the ferry and then arrive uh, in Victoria. And we've arrived at, at our last site for the day, the Royal BC Museum. Um, and we are joined by Stephen. So, la and last but not least. So Stephen Davies is uh, a new colleague of mine, um, which I'm very excited about uh, here at the Royal BC Museum. Stephen is the Indigenous Learning Program Developer at the Royal BC Museum. We'll, we'll be exploring over the coming years ways to build and nurture relationships within the community. Um, so thank you for being here, Stephen. And you are outside of the museum, um, which is, looks like a beautiful day. And I know that because I'm, I'm right beside you. So um, it's welcome, looking Stephen. very beautiful. Thank you. Yes. Thanks, Chris. And thanks, Jenny, in the, in the background as well. Um, so nice to meet everybody and, and uh, be here. I hope you had a good flight. Um, we're going to be here for about uh, just under a minute and then I'm going to go over and show you a piece of artwork here, a public art. And then after that, we're going to jump inside into the, the First Peoples Gallery for a little bit of a video share there. Um, so again, yes, I'd like to acknowledge the Songhees and Esquimalt nations here, uh, as well as the Wasanich, which are a little bit further up the peninsula in the north. Uh, my ancestry is traced to Snonemo, 
which is the middle of the island almost on the east coast, otherwise known as Nanaimo. Um, but I've been born and raised down here, so I feel very, very privileged to be a visitor on this territory, but now to be working at the Royal BC Museum for the next two years. So, yeah, I'm the, the newest to the team, but uh, we have a great team, very supportive, and it's a really nice place to work. Um, I guess I'll take you over to the spindle world. Yeah. So I, I'm told that uh, actually prior to colonization, the inner harbor here was really, really uh, a vital source of food for the local nations. In fact, there was uh, where the empress is here, uh, there were clam beds which fed thousands of people. And now, as you can see, it's paved over. Um, but uh, let me get in the frame here. Uh, this is a really nice feature, um, I think, of museums that uh, feature Indigenous artists' work um, on location here. To give you an idea about a bit more about the history, the true history here, um, which is thousands of years of, uh, of stewardship of the land. And I'm not so sure you may be familiar with the spindle world. It's actually a Coast Salish, um, I become a Coast Salish icon. And there's been a lot of work to revitalize this design, which in fact was used to um, clothe people, you know, uh, make wool clothes. Um, and the artist here, Chris, if you can share the photo, um, is Clarence Butch Dick. He designed seven spindle whirls. Um, this is uh, an image from a documentary that we made a few months ago uh, in the summer. And Clarence Butch Dick, his, uh, he's worked in education for over 20 years. Um, he's so-called retired, but what happens, what's funny is, is retirement for elders is not retirement. Um, in fact, he is very busy and, and uh, sharing his knowledge and um, a really important part, uh, a family member up and down the coast, actually, he's related to so many people, him and his wife. And his, his son is Butch, sorry, Bradley. And Bradley is, in fact, um, working with Cedar now quite a bit and stories, an amazing singer and drummer. Um, but the reason why I mentioned that is because it's a good example of, you know, how knowledge is shared and, um, you know, that that permission is required. So that kind of ties into my presentation. Um, you know, ultimately here as, as a visitor myself, uh, I'm looking at ways to design the learning programs so that they can reinforce and contribute to the self-determination of Indigenous peoples and communities all throughout the province. But actually, I'd like to think beyond the province, the provincial lines, because the coast, just the Coast Salish themselves, actually, um, in, uh, there are over 70 uh, tribes and nations within the Coast Salish. And these uh, artificial borders, in a sense, colonial borders, um, still don't exist to many people who travel back and forth. And uh, canoe journeys is one example of that, the revitalization of, of that, um, the generosity of knowledge and, and uh, transmission as well. But let's, let's step up to this, take a look at this spindle whirl. Um, this spindle whirl, I'm having trouble framing. Where's my camera operator? Uh, features three different um, indigenous nations. In fact, the theme of this artwork is diversity. And it shows you the, the interrelations. As you can see, there are th the three members um, are holding hands in the spindle world. In fact, traditionally, this would, would have been made from red cedar, which is a very important um, uh, living source here on the coast. But um, this one has been bronzed. And in fact, there's a story in Snonemo where the cedar one was installed. In fact, it was it was stolen, and I don't think it's been returned. But um, something else about the spindle whirl is that it's also a symbol of 
um, family and matrimony. Um, and it's, as I said, it's been revitalized and is very much a part of many contemporary artists work now. Uh, how am I doing for time here? Let me just check my notes. We have just like, the museum's about to close in about one minute. <laughs> one minute. Yeah, maybe we can jump to the video then. Yeah, sure. That's all right. Sure. And I'll just do a little talking over it if necessary. But um, the reason why I'm sharing this video is to give you a sense of, um, you know, what it's like for me in terms of designing some learning programs and trying to build relationships, that relationality of both the work and the stories that needs to take place. Um, the way we we film this, um, a lot of it on sliders in sort of a, a west to east direction, which in fact is a Coast Salish direction. But it tells you, it uh, illustrates the, the challenges of having multiple narratives within one large open space as well. Um, You know, I have a question for you just as we move on here. This is a kukuli from the interior Coast Salish. But, you know, I'm wondering in what ways, as I, I've mentioned before, can the, these learning programs be designed so that they honor that knowledge? They also, they're co-authored and they also retain that IP or the, the ownership um, and commitment to indigenous folks and stories. Um, not only that, but also that intercultural exchange is another another thing that I'm really um, I'm focused on. Great. Well, thank you so much, Stephen. That, that was that was amazing and um, really super appreciated. And it, it felt like a, a perfect uh, end to our our cross country trip and. Um, and I know that you're gonna you're gonna come into the the office space here to be part of the discussion. So um, if you want to stop your video um, and mute yourself, then um, I'll invite everyone to come um, back into the room here. Thanks for we... joining. Yeah, thank, thank you so much, Stephen. Okay, people can see. And... Jenny, you can put it to gal uh, put us to gallery view too. So, so, um, so thank you, everyone. And I, I'm looking out for Stephen as he is coming down the hallway here. Um, thank you so much for sharing as we as we went across the country. Yes, a round of applause. Um, I should have mentioned this in the beginning, but this is a webinar. So if you're watching, um, you, you're you not able to uh, share your video or, or um, unmute yourself, uh, but you can ask questions in the Q&A box, which is just at the bottom uh, of your Zoom um, screen. Or if you're watching on Facebook Live, you could use the comment section on Facebook Live. Um, so we definitely have some questions from, from people. Um, remember, it's like the museum just closed. We're all just hanging out on the steps. We're keeping our six um, or two meters distance. Um, we're masked up and um, we're just having a, a chat because seeing all these different museums, uh, I didn't even know what to expect, but I was really struck by all the, the really touching connection points uh, between institutions. I think- um, Your dinosaurs? <laughs> Issues around transformation and stories uh, seem to be really strong, whether it's um, uh, natural history or human history uh, and creating spaces where people can really be uh, interested to lean in and learn more um, and the generosity of sharing that way. So um, before we get to the questions, are there any, any reflections just from, from, from you all visiting the other, the other museums? Would anyone like to share any initial reflections from or connections from the other museums? Rebecca. I'd just like to say it really makes me want to travel. Absolutely. I want to go and do this in person and see some of you and uh, explore the 
whole extent of your museum. So thank you for the little like <laughs> insight into them because we just got to get back out there soon, hopefully. So thank you. Well, Rebecca, that, that speaks to a comment that was from Chris, Christina uh, McCarthy, who visited four out of the five of these fabulous museums. Saskatchewan Museum is now on her list. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> Anyone else like to share just a, any thoughts or connections uh, that you made from listening to the others? Canadian museums are cool. I think we spent a lot of time thinking about museums around the world and not enough time thinking about museums right here in our country, whether they are local, provincial, or national. Uh, so please, please, please visit all uh, our Canadian museums because uh, they tell really, really important stories as we saw just today from natural history to world cultural to indigenous perspectives. These are all very, very important stories to tell right here in Canada. And I can't say enough that like, as we flew from Halifax to Toronto and then flew to Regina and then took a car to Edmonton and then biked to Victoria, we passed by so many different museums along the way as well. So um, these are, we are just a few, just like a little bit of a large um, uh, amount of museums, uh, big and small throughout, uh, throughout the country. So um, yeah, can't say, can't say that enough, so. All right, so we do have some questions. Um, one question from Kate, and this is to our RAM uh, friends. How often do turtles eat? Oh yes, I can definitely answer that. Can you hear me okay, Chris? Yep. Okay, great. So our turtles are fed three times a week. Uh, we again, they just were fed yesterday and it is so fun to get a chance to see them when they are eating because it's a bit of a feeding frenzy and they love to go for the carrots and the cucumbers. Uh, so again, yes, three times a week that they're fed. Um, I don't know, behind us here, we also have our, our northern pike, Lucy. She's also fed regularly three times a week and she gets little goldfish and rainbow trout. So. Again, um, yeah, some great feeding schedules here done by our live animals team. And we did have one comment just as you were doing your five minute tour is wondering if the snake was actually real or not, um, just because it's such an interesting juxtaposition to have taxidermy with real animals. That's um, quite like They're all real. quite provocative and, and um, so, so interesting, so. The snake is real. Yeah, we also wanted to say that, you know, the den you could see through the video, well, it's way bigger than what you can actually see because there is an area in the, the back of the diorama where the snake can go freely. So this is not the only space that the animal has available. We followed the rules and the guidelines of the Canadian Association of Zoos and Aquariums. So everything you know uh, is uh, vetted and considered in the design of the dioramas that includes live animals as well. So the well-being of the uh, animals uh, is a top priority for us. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question from Kate about Pier 21. And I also wanted to just say, Stephanie, when just showing those cards and the, just thinking about the, the trust and generosity to, for someone to share their immigration story um, out to other visitors is just uh, really amazing. Um, there's a, just a question in terms of when was when did Pier 21 become a museum? Because you talked about its its active use as a um, and then transitioning into a museum. Oh, you're muted, but there we go. Sorry. Uh so Pier 21 is a little bit of an interesting um, facility because, you know, it was an immigration facility that closed in 71. And then people started, like nothing really happened with it. And then some basically concerned citizens or folks that were into the history and what Pier 21 represented got together and founded a historical society. So the museum started as a historical society really in the 90s, in the late 90s, and then it evolved and it eventually got its national designation. And then from there, it became a national museum. And then there were these major renovations to do this uh, permanent exhibit that was that overview of immigration history that kicked off 
um, in 2015. That's when that reopened from what I remember. I started working there in 2017. So I'm like, pretty sure on those dates. But the interesting thing about this is a lot of people know it as Pier 21. And so when it became a national museum, for some people, it was almost like, what are you doing to my story? And then it's an exciting opportunity to go, well, now that we're this national museum, you can see how the history of the building and the people came through it fits within the bigger stories of immigration to this country. Mm -hmm. So I was probably more and than what you're looking for as an answer. No, but no, I that's great. And, and just to say that uh, Kate wrote, just saying no, it wasn't Kate who's the educator, it was one of Kate's uh, students who asked that question. Great question. So, yeah. yeah, thank you. And it, you oh. mentioned, you showed the image of the Komagata Maru, um, mm -hmm. which Stephen was showing the inner harbor, which is where um, that took place. So, um, like a really important uh, history to to know, mm -hmm. um, and uh, like really sad, sad and um, uh, tragic history. That's and it's important. And something else I just want to point out because I'm on the East Coast and I'm from Quebec, and this Western history because. Um, folks coming across the Pacific and learning about the immigration history there was not something I learned about in school. And it's not really commonly known in Eastern Canada. So being able to talk about this um, in an East Coast museum, uh, I just, I love because I want more people to understand sort of the, the breadth and depth and the impacts of immigration uh, in this country. Anyway, I'm really, yeah. I'm getting far too enthusiastic. So I'm gonna give it back to you. Yeah. There's, there's no such thing as far too enthusiastic. Um, you are among museum educators here. That is true. I'm among my people, so um, I will nerd out with the best of them. We do have two uh, questions from from youth, uh, so I always like turn to to their questions first. Um, Alana and Madeline, uh, two different questions, two different kids. How old are the turtles, and how fast do painted turtles swim? <laughs> oh, I'm so happy. Again, I, the turtles are just some of my absolute favorites, you guys. So I'm tickled that you're uh, enjoying them as well. Um, so again, we received these turtles as adult turtles. Um, they had come from another life in captivity. And we were so fortunate to get them as again, they are um, an important species in Alberta. And they have, again, so much, so much to learn about them and, and in terms of the environment and what their needs are. Um, but as, as we talked about before, I'm not sure if I mentioned this, but turtles can, can span all the way to 100 years. They have incredibly long lifespans. Um, males mature around eight years, so they become adults at around eight years old. Females are be, become adults around 12 to 15 years. So um, I will check in, you know, I, I usually love to refer back to our experts and you definitely saw Pete in our video, who I can ask if they have the approximate age, but sometimes it is a little bit tricky because they're coming from other areas of captivity and even their former home might not have known exactly how old they were, but they are adults. Um, they do get an annual vet check to make sure that they are healthy and that they're doing well. Um, we've been told they lost weight, that they've had lots of room to swim around and be in healthy shape. So I'll definitely um, ask about that. Same with the speed. That might be a question for our live animals team. So what, I, what we can do is we can actually post our RAM uh, contact information. You're so welcome to email us. Um, from what I see in the tank, they are pretty speedy, especially when it's feeding time. You have but, to get out your stopwatch. Yes, yes, it'd be so nice to get that information for you. So we'll make sure to put that in the chat box. And speaking of information, I, I misspoke and my colleague Liz uh, corrected me. Thank you, Liz. Uh, the Como Katamaru was actually the Vancouver Harbor, uh, not the Victoria Harbor. Um, and uh, speaking of Victoria, though, um, Ruth asked uh, Stephen yeah. those wonderful um, presentation. Uh, is it true that the important figure on a totem pole is at the bottom of the pole? Hi, sorry about that. Can you hear me now? 
Yeah, all good. Hi. Um, yes, I think it really depends on the nation, but that is my understanding. So the answer is yes. Um, for example, in Snonemo, it's often a frog on the bottom of the poles from what I've heard and also in, in Wasanich too. But the frog symbolizes the, um, you know, is, is the support for the community is often the, the frog in Salish on, uh, in my territory, the island. Was it good? Hello? Actually, I'm muted. Um, yeah, that's great, Stephen. Thank you. Um, and we had a question, and maybe this is for both Rebecca and Kieran. Um, what is the, the largest dinosaur? The question is that you found, but probably that is uh, within your museum or that's represented within your museum. Uh, well, Scotty the T-Rex is the largest one in our museum. Other uh, dinosaurs that have been found in Saskatchewan are things like duckbill dinosaurs, hadrosaurs, uh, Triceratops and other Ceratopsians, um, Ankylosaurs, Truodon. There's a whole bunch, but Scotty is the one that stands out the most for for me, I would say. The thing about dinosaurs is we often find just like one small piece and then we extrapolate the rest of it and do a lot of math to figure out how big we think the dinosaur is. So that's a, that's a big question um, that a lot of paleontologists would like to claim that their dinosaur find is the biggest based on like one vertebrae. So that's why we really like the Futalankosaurus because so much of it was found. Uh, the biggest dinosaur that we have on display that is mostly real at the ROM is the Barosaurus, which we lost in our museum for like 40 years. Um, so, you know, when your parents tell you to put away your Lego when you're a kid and put away those puzzle pieces as a kid so they don't get lost, you can remind them that even full grown adults lose dinosaurs in museums <laughs> it's like what more can we say um i just i wanted to go around just uh for in the last two minutes just any final words that you have um again thank you everyone for joining and we've had like a great great exchange in the chat and great questions um and again i really appreciate all the generosity uh, coast to coast um, in in sharing uh, a little bit about where you're where you're at, but also just how you you do what you do too in modeling that. So um, yeah, final words. We don't need to go from coast to coast. You can just um, whoever feels inspired to ram. Lisa. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, I just I just want to say thank you so much, Chris. This is you know so special to connect with museum educators across the country. We're very passionate about our work. We love what we do. And to be able to share it with our public is so special. So I'm just, I'm so thrilled that we, we had this today and, um, and thank you so much again. Thank you very much for hosting us. And I'm so glad that our public was asking so many great questions. So if you have more questions, we shared our contact information in the chat. So feel free to reach out to us. So, so many questions about snakes and turtles in the chat. So. <laughs> we have many more in our collection. <laughs> okay. um, so who would like to go next? As final, final what words, final thoughts, Rebecca. Yeah, I echo that. Thank you so much for inviting us to be part of this. It's been really fun to share uh, some museum education experience with like colleagues from across the country. Really exciting. Um, I had a great time and I do want to thank my coworker Chad for doing such a great job of the uh, camera work. So it's, it's, uh, we're a team in, in this museum. We're not a huge museum, but we all work together. And so um, it was great to work with you guys today too. So. I was thinking, I wish my arm was longer, Stephen, when you were outside that I could have like done both, but it's just a little too far. <laughs> but it's nice, Rebecca, that you had um, some a camera person. Colleagues, it's what it's what it's all about. So, um, who would like to go next? <laughs> go. Yeah, Stephen. Oh, I just wanted to thank everybody. It's really nice chatting with you too, and um, I look forward to hopefully we can continue to network. And um, it's really exciting to see what's happening 
eastward, um, if not north and south as well and across the Pacific. But um, again, yeah, very nice chatting with you. And, and thanks again to Chris for inviting me. Yeah, next time we'll go north. Um, uh, Stephanie yeah. or Karen? Yeah, I can go next. Um, just to mirror what everyone else is saying, this is really great. I, yes, and definitely go north. Oh man, the north is amazing throughout. Um, and there's so much really cool stuff up there. Um, but yeah, I just to be able to celebrate what we do to geek out, nerd out, um, just be passionate about what floats our boat. Uh, yeah, I'm, thank you for giving me this chance um, and this opportunity. Yeah, we'll definitely go north. We asked some of our colleagues up north um, and it just wasn't the right time, but uh, we'll, we'll uh, next time when we do this for sure. And last but not least, Toronto. I think as like museum fans, we miss museums, yeah. we miss being in them, we miss doing it, we miss seeing stuff, going to see mm -hmm. new exhibits, touching the old, you know, hands-on things. Like we miss uh, museums. And I think as fans and as visitors, I, I get it and I'm here with you. I think something that everyone should know to all like uh, the families and teachers that are watching is know that uh, museum educators miss teaching so much. We miss teaching kids. We miss teaching families. We miss interacting with the public. And so this might seem like a small thing for all of y'all, but this was in many ways, one of the most recent times that we've actually been able to do this work that before we did multiple times a day. So thank you all for being here. Thank you all for all those turtle questions. Cause I have a lot of turtle questions too and we got to talk about turtles. Um, so thank you all for being here, for being here with us because you, you gave us the reason why we do this work. Mm -hmm. And when I think of the, the care of creating a safe space uh, for youth and, and kids, I think of you and your, your camp program, Kieran, and, and really setting the, the bar high on what it means to, to, to really create a, a safe space for, for youth to feel like museums are for them um, and that questions are okay to ask and that uh, growth is possible, right? So, um, but all of you, and we're, um, yeah, we're, we're museum educators. We do, one of my colleagues, uh, Kim, said to, to mention that we meet once a month as museum educators. So if there are any, any, any museum educators out there that would like to um, have a little community of, of dialogue, then yeah, come, come chat with uh, any of us and uh, love to have you. So, um, I, I, I sort of like, I can't, one more kid question about turtles. Do turtles eat bugs? Yes, yeah, they do. <laughs> <laughs> question, they eat insects. Um, you know, turtles, even though they would, if, if something's coming, you know, they're, they're very much likely to dip into the water and try and get away, but they're actually pretty formidable. They've got, you know, they've got a very sharp beak. They've got sharp, claw, sharp claws. So they are definitely omnivores both plants and, uh, and meat as well, insects, other living animals. And just a very quick shout out to our awesome coworker, Tori, who filmed us today. Yay, you know, it's so good to have your community around you supporting you. So reach out to your friends and your coworkers and your families. They're so important. And thank you for all the turtle questions. <laughs> And we, we have one more program for International Museums Day um, at 11 o'clock on the West Coast. So I don't expect um, Stephanie to take part in it. Um, but uh, I'm gonna do, Kim and I are gonna do a, a late night uh, tour of the museum, like weird spaces within the museum uh, tonight. So if you're interested then in that, you can come go to the Royal BC Museum uh, website and, and check that out. So. Um, Thanks everyone. Happy International Museum Day, uh, everyone across the country. And uh, until next time. Bye. All right, bye. Juan, thank you.